Good morning. We've got uh, two bills on the calendar today, House Bill 245 by Chairman Willard. Let me ask everyone, as always, to place your cell phones in uh, the silent or vibrate setting. And uh, Chairman Willard, you're recognized. I'm going to have to, just fair warning, I'm going to have to zip up to rules for a little bit. So the chair, yes, sir. And uh, so I think the vice chair will go ahead and uh, uh, go ahead and, and fill in once he gets here. Uh, we, it may not even take that long. So I'll just hand it over to you and we'll get the ball rolling. Thank you. Thank you. And again, I apologize for being uh, tardy. Back, we dropped it down from 60 days to 30 days. And the problem we're running into is this is really a financial crunch. This is an economic matter. And uh, 90 to 60, is that? Well, it went from 90 to 60. This is going from 60 Take to 30. Time, yeah. Yeah. Under this bill. Uh, and uh, the use of the detention center is really, from a cost standpoint, it, it's just a, a task that we've got to look at and we're trying to find a way it's to. Going, sir. Uh, through appropriations to meet the needs for juvenile justice. And uh, I have also with me today, of course, the uh, Director of Juvenile Justice, Commissioner Mur Murray, if you'd like to address the uh, committee on this. Uh, we are looking at doing this on the basis of saving about $10 million annually by uh, lowering it down. As uh, I was, was pointed out earlier, there are, I think, uh, 11 or 14 independent courts that keep and do their own the larger jurisdictions, DeKalb, Fulton, Cobb. Uh, this is really servicing what are the smaller uh, courts. And uh, if it's not done, the problem we have to then look at is finding other programs that are sponsored through juvenile justice and perhaps eliminating or greatly reducing those type programs. So it's, it's important we try to meet this financial need. As I understand the substitute, it, it reduces it down to 30 days. Uh, I know it's a budget-driven situation, but I also notice that there's a sunset on the provi on uh, this particular issue, which forces us, depending on uh, what happens in the context of recovery, exactly. to go ahead and re-examine the issue in, in X number of years' time, Which and if we can have a review, uh, of, it. Have a review of it, and yeah. if we're in a position to increase that time, I don't think anybody uh, would uh, dispute the notion of, uh, of the worthiness of the program, but it's a matter of striking a balance between budget dollars and, um, and the program itself and not going into other sacrifices, I think the Correct. chair uh, well said. Yeah. So it, it's a balance, and it's not a balance we want to strike uh, or be put in a position to strike, yeah. but it's one that we're, we're compelled to given the circumstances. Any questions for the author? Mr. Levitas? I appreciate that, and I'm going to entertain that in just a second. Is there anyone in the audience to speak against this bill, 245? Going once, going twice. Was that was there a question? Mr. Collins. Thank you, Chair. Is we all? Okay. Yeah. Mr. Chair. Thank you, Chairman. I, I understand the economics here, but is, is it fair to also categorize this bill as the same bill that uh, it was really coupled together last year with another bill that we did not act upon based on very real concern, except the only thing here is we're sort of packaging this in an economic problem. Uh, Representative Collins, I'm trying to remember history-wise what we did last year. There was, I believe, a review of it. I'm not sure if it was tied in with another bill or not. It may have been, but it was about two years ago we reduced it down. It's borne out for about uh, two years ago, 90 to 60 days, right. I believe it was. Well, last year, I remember a subcommittee. We had a subcommittee, and then went to full committee, and we just had, because the subcommittee we dealt, and I believe commission we dealt with this. That it was okay. Sure, come on up, commissioner. Come on. Thank you. Uh, last year, we uh, sought to uh, eliminate uh, the 60-day program, uh, and it was not so much budget-driven last year. We were seeking to approach this category of juvenile in a different way and totally eliminate the six-to-day program. 
uh, as you are aware, that did not happen. We're not seeking to eliminate the program. I understand the importance of this program to juvenile court judges. What we're seeking to do is simply reduce it from six to days to nine, um, six to days to thirty days, so that we can balance our budget and and enjoy the savings that we need to uh, to do to meet our budget cut. So. That's the primary difference from last year to this year. This is not a, an abolishment. It's only to, to reduce it. The program will remain the same. It'll just be 30 days less. Mr. Chair, may I follow? Sure. Uh, and, and along that same line, you were looking to abolish it last year based on the fact that you did not budget for, you actually did not budget for the new bed space. And we got into that issue, so it was in some ways an economic issue last year as well. well then you I'm based not. it on that fact that you didn't get it, so we're going to cut back so we didn't have to budget yes. for the new bed space. There were other reasons, but that certainly was one. Mrs. Cooper. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative Willard, I'm sorry I missed the subcommittee meeting, so it's because of conflicts. Um, I mean, these are children that have committed what would be a felony in an adult or misdemeanor of high and aggravated nature. It doesn't look like there's any fail safe. What happens after the 30 days and you have a highly uh, combative, disturbed young person? Uh, what is, uh, I mean, there are, there are, me, go ahead, I, I just what there, happens? Do you just turn them back to their parents there, or on the street or whatever? There are other alternative programs back in the local area that they can have through probation, we'll call it. And uh, Commissioner Murray, you may want to follow up on that as far as the type of things that may be available through juvenile justice back at their home area. In house? In, there is. Well, a, go ahead. Well, again, these are, these are juveniles who have not yet been committed. The court has sent, sentenced them for this, what's now the 60 day sentence. Once they complete that sentence, if they don't follow the law and, 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 and behave themselves, the court can choose, they have their options. The court could choose to return those children to the Department of Juvenile Justice on a longer sentence. Uh, they could be placed on probation. They could be given any number of sanctions uh, if they don't behave, but the purpose of the short-term sentence is to get their attention so that the hope is they don't rec don't recidivate, they don't come back in the agency. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. Mr. Sessler. Okay, Mr. Chairman, um, I'd like to address some questions the commissioners have had. Sure. Teenagers being the victim of a violent crime by, by some 17 year old, some 16 year old in the community. Um, so I don't want to treat this lightly. Mr. Chester, could you uh, push the button on your. Uh... Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Apologize. Uh, we don't want to treat this lightly. Uh, if, if you were unconstrained by resources, would you be making the case that moving from 60 days to 30 days? Is an appropriate public policy approach with respect to um, rehabilitating young people and public safety? Well, if I were unconstrained by resources, I would have to I, uh, give thought to our, our last year's discussion with the short term program. Uh, my earlier position was that there was a better way to manage this type of child other than a short term program, but after many, many discussions with juvenile court judges, I understand the importance of this program to their courts. So I'm not sure at this point if I were unconstrained by resources, I would be seeking to abolish the program. Uh, <coughs> I think I could still possibly be looking to seek to reduce it to 30 days because we need to turn over those youngsters coming through the department. I need those bed spaces to serve juvenile, juveniles who I believe are more serious offenders. These juveniles are going into our secure beds. We're paying the same amount per day to manage these juveniles as we are the most serious juveniles who come into the department. And, and I ask the question because at the end of the day, managing beds, whether it's a budget downturn or not, still becomes an issue of resources. And with, with respect to outcomes and what's best for rehabilitating young people, I'm just asking the question, what's the most appropriate way to do that? And I just, I, I ask the question because I don't want this committee to be guilty of circular reasoning. I, I want us to be very clear if it's a resource decision we're making, we are making a resource decision, but if it's counter to what's best to rehabilitate young people or for public safety, we need to do that in, in, in open sight. And I just wanted to hear from you what the research was, what the findings had been with respect 
to outcomes, recidivism, if kids are not spending 60 days or if judges don't have this, this available to them? My deputy reminded me of some research that we do have, which indicates that uh, the recidivism for the, the uh, 30 day program, we believe, will be no greater than it was when it was a 60 day program. When we reduced the program, when, when Senate Bill 134 was passed several years ago and it was reduced from 90 to 60 days, uh, that proved to be a good thing in terms of recidivism. Uh, it's our belief based on that that to reduce it from 60 days to 30 days will not increase the recidivism. It's my belief that it'll be good public policy. It'll be consistent with public safety. The youngsters that are being served by this program will continue and receive the same type of service. Uh, that it'll be consistent with good public safety rather than, than the reverse. And Mr. Chairman, I'll just wrap up by saying I, I do have parents whose kids have been victims. I've had, you know, freshmen in high school have had their face planted in the wall and brutalized by people in our community by teenagers involved and um, in crimes would be felonies had they been committed by an adult. So we're going to have to answer to parents on this. Um, I, I mean, you, you certainly bring a lot of experience and credibility as, as our commissioner. I appreciate your, your share in this. It's just I want the committee to be very careful that we know we're, we're making resource decisions that have a very direct public safety implication. We need to be, be conscious of that. Thank you. We'll try to go in order of the, who's who's rang in. Uh, Representative Franklin, he waves. All right, Representative Benfield. Uh, thank you. First, I just have a comment. I'm not necessarily swayed by statistics in these juvenile cases because I think they're so intensely personal and fact-driven, and I'm, I've got real concerns about taking away the discretion of the juvenile ch judges. And the judges I know really look at the facts in these cases and, and make an individual determination. Uh, I, I've got uh, one sort of technical question. I was trying to find the, the law on this. Uh, in the heading, it talks about delinquent and unruly children, but nowhere in the, the actual text of the revisions do I see unruly children? Is uh, That's maybe more of a question for Ms. Travis. Okay. But, but this is specifically affecting the delinquent acts, the reduction. Okay. And uh, the other question I have is what happens if this bill fails, if we do nothing and the law remains as is? And I'm sorry if you addressed that before I came in, but what are, those, what are the consequences if we do nothing? I'll, I'll start out. We did talk about that a little bit, and that is that they'd have to look at other programs that are oriented as far as <coughs> probations, uh, school programs, right. other ways that they try to treat children in the community because there is still a need to <coughs> to find a $10 million reduction in the appropriations part of it for this coming fiscal year. I can only verify what Representative Avila just indicated. That would be a greater problem for us to look at other programs that we'd have to cut. We think of the program that we operate, the impact to our our mission will be least by reducing this program. Thank you. All right. Representative Ramsey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just want to speak to a little bit of the discussion we had in, in subcommittee because we heard from the juvenile justice, uh, uh, the juvenile uh, court judges. We heard from uh, the state's uh, child advocate and, and uh, of course, from Commissioner Murray. And I, th I think there was a recognition by all those parties that, that there are some policy matters here that need to be looked at in a comprehensive way, and I think that was last year's effort to, to kind of take a, a comprehensive look at the policy uh, underlining the short-term program and really how we deal with, uh, uh, with, with kids that are, that are in this position. Uh, I, I think Representative Abrams, she, she offered the, the sunset as an amendment to, to, to the bill. And, and the sense of the subcommittee was it was a it was it was kind of a good split the baby and that it forces us to come back in two years and 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 look at this look at the policy implication because we know this is sunsetting while also recognizing the incredibly difficult budget climate that they're in and, and and 
the, the savings that will result from dropping it from 60 to 30 that, that they frankly have planned for in their budget. And if we don't do that, they're going to have to make some, some, some difficult cuts elsewhere. So, All right. Thank you, uh, Representative Collins. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I understand this, and we went through a great deal of discussion last year about this and the policies. Is the problem that I keep coming back to is as a legislator who believes that when budget matters come, public safety correction should be our first and foremost decision, not a cut down the line. This is the part that concerns me not, as Chairman Willard you know, did a wonderful job. The, the metro areas are, are fine. I mean, they have other resources. It's my outlines that have the little more issue. And speaking of his uh, – Chairman Ramsey actually said split the baby. I have a possibility here because one of the things that I – you talked about the recidivism rate dropped 90 to 60. 60 is still a long way. It's still a good term. As someone who was trapped for four and a half months inside a, a wire understanding I can't leave, I could deal with 30 days a lot better than I could deal with a lot longer time because 30 is – that's just a month. What if – would there be any – what would be the fiscal impact if I offered an amendment on line 28 of page 2 to strike 30 and put 45? believe that would get us to our ten million dollar savings that uh, Representative Willard had mentioned earlier. In fact, I'm sure it would not. May I ask, there's also one of the, the uh, judge of the uh, juvenile court counselors here. Uh, he might want to respond to some of this because what you're looking, the other programs would de need to be cut down, but they, they are looking at alternatives. The judges are looking at alternatives, which are uh, the ankle type uh, monitoring systems that can be keeping the child maybe in the community in certain circumstances where they were previously being used to go to the uh, temporary detention center. I, I, there again, are things they're looking at. I appreciate that. And, and again, I, I, my biggest problem here is I guess it goes back to the bottom line. We're putting a dollar sign and saying, here's a dollar sign on a program and saying, because we've, and I appreciate, I, you're in a bad position, Mr. Commissioner. I appreciate that. But at the same point, can I attach a dollar sign onto this issue and say, and this is where I'm struggling with it. I believe I have talked to the child. I've talked to other juvenile court judges, and I think everybody is beat down by the economic <coughs> argument. That's what concerns me. Every, you know, all right, fine. We know this year the economic, so we'll just have to. That's where I'm struggling with this. So, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate it. Thank you, Representative Knox. What how, do we have any assurance that we're going to be able to do this 30 days? Because what I've understood from some juvenile court judges that they're sending folks to facilities that they get halfway there and get a call and say don't come it's full and they have to go back and they end up back in the court at the juvenile court building saying here I am back again what do we do with them and they, they don't have a recourse then but to <coughs> let them loose because they don't have an ankle monitor they don't have anything they just gotta I mean, we're, well, these are folks that are not functioning in the community to begin with so <coughs> that's the reason we're the, why the judge wants to be able to put them somewhere where they can we, we can manage the 30 days. We have not turned down any youth. In fact, <coughs> by law, we, we cannot. What we have done, if, if a facility has been full, we have sent that youth to another uh, detention center. But we can manage the 30-day program without that being problematic. Right. Thank you. Representative Levin. <coughs> Let me preface this comment by saying I doubt you'll find anybody on this committee who is more pro-law uh, enforcement than me and probably get tagged by th that as a uh, derogatory term more than anything. But the reality is we are in a budget crunch. And the reality is you guys are doing everything you can to make sure that people are safe and that we are not putting offenders out on the street. And there is no doubt in my mind, and at least I hope everybody here recognizes that that you have no intention of putting people on the street that you think are going to recommit offenses and endanger the public. So I'm prefacing that comment. I, you don't even need to respond to it. I think that's so obvious. So what I think we need to do is make the committee aware, if this doesn't happen, um, it, it's a two-part question. If this doesn't happen, give the committee an example of the kind of programs that you would be required to cut if you have to come up with the $10 million somewhere else. That's part one. <coughs> and part two, <coughs> have you had anybody come to you with any data supported study complaint that says here's what will happen, here's the danger, and, and these number of people will recommit, these are the number of violent offenses that will commit if we change this day from 30 to 60, keeping in mind that's a number we picked. That could have been 10 days were cut into 5, 20 to four, 10, but it happens to be 60 to 30. So 
I, I know that's a compound question, but if either the author or, or the commissioner can respond to that, I would appreciate it. Yeah, we'd, we'd have to look at some community programs <coughs> that are working well for us. And the community programs <coughs> don't cost near as much as running secure programs. We'd also have to look at some of our secure uh, facilities. As you know, we operate 30 facilities, 22 detention centers, uh, eight long-term facilities. We'd have to look at some of our secure beds uh, where we send our most serious and violent and chronic juvenile offenders. <coughs> We'd have to look at cutting back, reducing business. That would put us in a position to where we, we'd have some serious offenders that we wouldn't have a secure place for. Uh, we'd have to perhaps look at double bunking in some of our secure facilities. That to me would be a disaster. We've worked hard in Georgia the last 10 years, 12 years nearly now to not do that on the juvenile side. That goes totally against best practices. That gets us back into difficulty with the federal government. We'd have to take some drastic steps. Yeah, I shouldn't say that. Right. That in my mind would in no way be good public policy for Georgia with juvenile offenders. This to me is the least impact given the budget situation that, that we're in and the fact that we have to <coughs> make some cut. Uh, we have studied this in every way that I know how, and this is what this is what, what we come to. And, and the second part of my question was, has anybody come to you with any data, not sort of pie-in-the-sky stuff, data-driven arguments that if you cut this program from 60 days to 30 days, here's the number of folks who are going to recommit, <clears throat> here's the number of violent offenders. I understand the desire not to cut back judicial discretion, um, but but we have to cut somewhere, period. It has to be done. we got $10 million hole that you all have to fill. So the it, my question is, has anybody come and said, Here's the data we have that will show you what will happen if you cut back to 30 days, and here's the danger posed by it. If we cut back to 30 From, days. Right. In other words, has anybody who said, I don't support what you're trying to do, come to you with actual data that says, here's what will happen. This is the floodgates will open. You're going to have rapists and armed robbers back on, on the street who are going to recommit. I understand your question, and the answer is no. Okay. No one's approaching you. Mr. Chairman, at the appropriate time, I have a motion. Okay. Thank you. Representative Franklin. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you said that you would not be able to meet your, your budget goals of, uh, of the $10 million. Would you be able to meet your budget goals if we just close the department entirely? If, if the objective is saving money rather than, rather than a criminal justice system, which is a, 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 which is a legitimate <coughs> function of the state, is, is criminal justice. Uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a little concerned that we're, we're thinking we're going to uh, we're, we're going to lessen the impact of, of, uh, of the state's function in criminal justice uh, just because of a budget issue. And I, I would like to see you uh, actually trying to defend why you need more money rather than just, uh, than just going about saying, well, we're going to cut, cut programs uh, in, a, in a criminal justice environment. And uh, when, when, when there are, are departments and agencies that are no legitimate function of the civil government. I'd like to see you actually go to bat for your own department. Well, that's, no. that's my point. I need a total response, but I think what happens is the governor has mm -hmm. set parameters that have been required by all departments in order to be met, and that's true mm -hmm. with juvenile justice. And, uh, everybody's cut across the board because of the possible facing right now. I think, and I, agree I, think, I think some good. should probably be increased, others eliminated, and um, instead of an across-the-board cut, but that's my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Cooper. Well, I'm going to change. I was going to ask a question, but I just got a call from our uh, child advocate, and, and I happen to have great respect for Mr. Rollins and his knowledge, and he says this is not pleasant, and he said I could quote him, that he has looked at all the options and it's absolutely the best option in a terrible worse situation and that you know if we didn't do this we'd lose 
probation officers in the community and all. Absolutely. And so I will, not that I don't respect you, Representative <laughs> Willard, but this is the person dealing, this is the person dealing with it every day and the problems that occur when thing, bad things happen. So thank you for thank recognizing. You. And Representative Ramsey. I, I wave, Mr. Chairman. Waves. All right, that's all the member questions. Uh, don't have anyone signed up. Is there anyone from the public that wishes to speak on this legislation? All right. Uh, got a motion from Representative Levitas. I move to pass LC 293703S. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Um, is there any, any any amendments to the bill? All right. Any further discussion from the committee? I don't see any lights. All right. Uh, I'll call the previous question. All those in favor of passage of SB or excuse me HB 245 by substitute uh, signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed, no. No. Okay. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. Thank HB 245 is passed. Uh, we'll call HB 287 now. Representative Benton is the author. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm sorry, I'm talking like everyone else. There's an I. I a nay. A nay, okay. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Appreciate it. Bring to you today House Bill 245 as a um, committee sub. That's LC 293703S. I'm sorry, wrong, wrong bill. Excuse me. 287. Pull the wrong one out. Still a committee sub, LC 293713S. Okay. Uh, what we're attempting to do here is to uh, make an exception in the law of where uh, police officers can use radar, uh, and this exception would be inside a school zone. Uh, this uh, bill uh, idea came to me from a school principal in my district. They couldn't get people to slow down in the school, school zone. Uh, uh, any time during the day, but especially, it seemed like it. They were, they were. Uh, I guess seemed awfully fast during uh, uh, the bringing in of school and letting out of school. And so, uh, this is the bill before you. I'll be glad to answer any questions uh, from the committee members. <laughs> Representative Franklin, uh, is speed detection device defined in the code? Uh, I'm assuming that it is defined in the code. Uh, I, I believe officers can use radar, but they can also use estimation. Um, but uh, what we are looking at is is the distance from signs that the code now currently defines is inside a uh, municipality. It's 300 feet outside municipality. It's 600 feet, and we have schools that are. That, in, that are in both areas that where there is a speed limit sign and that includes a, the school speed limit sign, they're not allowed to run a radar within a certain distance of that sign. So um, if they, uh, by, by a, a local ordinance, moved that school speed limit sign further <laughs> away from the school, uh, then they would be, they would have that distance that they're looking for so they could could be in compliance with existing law, wouldn't they? That that's true, but in some areas you've got you've got cities that that bump into each other. Mm -hmm. You've got a school that is right there on the line. Uh, and you, so about what percentage of the schools no in the idea. state would would I, I, I would imagine that would be very small, and uh, it it seems to me that that uh, got, where we're straining out a gnat to to swallow a camel uh -huh. on this, where if we just had the school move the speed limit the school zone speed limit sign, uh, you'd take care of it without changing the law. Okay. Uh, Representative Franklin, sort of uh, to <coughs> piggyback on that, we in subcommittee, we, we heard this bill, uh, Representative Ramsey's subcommittee, and we 
we made some changes to sub subdivision B of that bill to provide that the ev evidence obtained only from uh, a speed detection device operated from within the uh, the school zone would be admissible. So it. it Correct. But, did, but could that include um, um, a, a radar camera, or it, does it actually have to be a, a radar gun in the hand of a officer? It's not. It's not a camera. Because sure. there are those somewhere. We'll indicated that a particular device designed to measure the speed or velocity of a motor vehicle and marked under the name VASCAR or any similar device operating the same or similar principle and any device with a measurement of speed or velocity based upon the Doppler principle of radar or the speed timing principle of laser, all such devices must meet or exceed the minimum performance specification established by the Department of Public Safety. So that could be done by a camera. <coughs> I don't know how I would read that, but it has to be with a Doppler, which is not by a camera, right? Right. Okay. Uh, let's go to Representative Setzler. Uh, to uh, Chairman Franklin's question, again, I appreciate your, your bringing the bill. I do have a concern um, that I would offer perhaps a friendly amendment. If, if it's not your intent to allow camera devices uh, that are not being actually operated by an officer, um, simply by simply mirroring the language that's, that's up on line 13, on line 13 it says, a, evidence obtained by county or municipal law enforcement officers in using speed detection devices. Um, I would simply s uh, offer to the author that I would, would offer a friendly amendment when it's pr appropriate time, Mr. Chairman, um, that would read um, on line 23, evidence obtained by county or municipal law enforcement officers in using speed detection devices within a certain distance to make sure there's no opening the door for um, unmanned cameras flashing people and taking and, and issuing um, citations. Again, that, that's, that's, that, is, that is a perpetual concern of mine, and I know you don't spend necessarily a lot of time on this committee, but I, I want to make sure that we, we've got our law enforcement officers using the device as opposed to a device that's set out there um, to issue a citation in an unmanned context. But, it, oh. but in the definition of a speed detection device have to do with Doppler and a camera would not be based on Doppler? Well, again, it might use a Doppler technique in calculating the, the speed. I mean, a, a, an unmanned device mm -hmm. could use that, use that same technology. I want to make sure that we have a person with a device required to do this. Otherwise, I support completely what you're doing. I just do not want to have an, I don't want to be introducing the capacity in Georgia law for cameras acting alone using Doppler technology to using Doppler technology to perceive the speeder, take a camera to document that, much like a traffic light camera. Uh, I want to make sure we're not opening the door for that. That's that, that, that's all I want to address. You know, if the, the committee so so sees that as being necessary for the bill, I, I have no problem with it. I, uh, I I do not see the same problem that that you see, but if the, the committee so desires, then then that's fine. And, and just, I'm just mirroring the language from from line 13 above. So. Uh, Ms. Travis, do you? Can you enlighten us any on on the camera issue? That yeah, <laughs> under the current definition, cameras would not be included with the. I would agree with you. Okay. I don't see where a camera falls under the laser or the Doppler Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Representative. Uh, well, Representative Benfield was next. I believe. Oh, thank you. Well, uh, Representative Levitas is helping me <laughs> since I. <laughs> seem to be incapable of conducting a search on this, but we're trying to find, I know because I worked on the bill allowing for cameras and red lights, that it, it's very specifically defined, and uh, the radar definition is, is separate and distinct, but we're trying to get clarification on that, so when we find the code section, I'll let you know, but um, it's it's a separate you know, it's, it's a separate definition altogether. And if there's clarifying language just so the camera debate can be removed from this bill and not impact this bill whatsoever, you know, I think that that might be a cautionary. We found it. So let's see if we can find that. Yeah, use of, wait, I think. Anyway, we'll, we'll Okay, continue. we'll come back to you. Uh, <laughs> Representative Collins. Uh, I, 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 just to add to this debate right now, again, following up and going back through this, this the deals with speeding and dealing with law enforcement regularly, 
they, that is that is the reason that was quote, the sa the statute was quoted earlier is the very binding uh, application on police officers. This is the only way they can they can make the speeding violations using VASCAR as an old technique of basically time and measure, and then the uh, radar detection is what we know of, and then the laser detection to add anything else. If I was from a defense attorney perspective, if a, if a law enforcement came in and used any kind of wallet. Item, it could have moved immediately, not because it's not in the statute. So I think to address the concern here, is that a possibility? Yes, but at the same point, for any law enforcement to use it, they would have to come back in and actually change this code section to be able to to do a speed detection. Law enforcement, the light cameras that we speak of on our red lights are dealing with a red light violation. They're not dealing with any kind of moving violation in this regard. I appreciate you know both Representative Settles and Franklin's, and, but dealing with law enforcement and regularly on this issue, and we've talked about it, we would have to go back in and change the code section on what actually determines the use of a speed detection device in prosecuting these cases. Thank you. Chairman Golick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This may have been, um, this may have been asked and answered already. Um, the normal operation of um, I guess the normal timing during the day of a school zone. Uh, we put in there one hour before the school t day and one hour after. Is that the, the, again, this may have been asked and answered already, is that the normal uh, time the, during the day? That's the, day the normal time you have, during the day. have the flashing Usually lights. you have flashing lights one hour before, um, not necessarily during the school day, but you have it flashing one hour before and one hour after to let people know that, that Students are being dismissed or, or, or br being brought in. Great. I just want to make sure that was consistent. Thank you. Representative Benton, the, but this also does apply to during school hours. Yes, is that uh -huh. correct? Yes. Okay. Representative Franklin. saying and possibly what Representative Setzler is saying is it's not the use of the radar. It's who's using the radar, whether it is a, a person or whether it is a camera that is operating the radar. If the radar is still being used, wh whether you've got that police officer with a little NASCAR uh, radar gun aiming at the traffic or whether a, a fixed inanimate camera has the VASCAR unit aimed at the traffic, and once it hits a certain, it, it goes over the speed limit, it takes the picture. And that's that's really what we have an issue with. It's the, the VASCAR is still being used. It's just, is it is it a certified peace officer taking the picture, or is it an inanimate camera taking the picture? Well, the, the issue of it being that the VASCAR unit is, is not in dispute. Can can I propose a very rare Levitas Benfield? Amendment. Um, what what Representative Benfield proposes, I think, is a good idea, which would be something along the lines, and I'm not proposing it yet, so don't counsel get get on me for reading it too fast. <coughs> would say something, a new subsection D that says something like, for the purposes of this code section, um, a traffic control device or whatever the the term of art shall not include any a traffic control signal signal monitoring device used to produce any photograph, micro photograph, electronic image, or videotape showing the identity of any person in a motor vehicle. Or you could say, or the motor, or you actually could stop it at there. You could say, shall not include, um, shall not include a traffic control monitoring device used to produce any photograph, micro photograph, electronic image, or videotape. That would make it clear that they cannot use any kind of picture. Well, it wouldn't be traffic <coughs> control because that's relating to the, to the, <coughs> Red lights. Right. Or what I'm saying, say or, or such device for the purpose of this code section. For purposes of this section, speed detection devices shall not be used to produce any photograph, micro photo, and, and they can't anyway. The technology is not yeah. there, but it but would just make it clear. add an assurance. If we can, uh, uh, let yeah. me ask uh, legislative counsel. It, am I correct? There, there is a provision 40-14-8 that is similar. <laughs> to this is there not that that deals with uh, uh, speed detection devices in school zones but you've got a, the other issue about the phone. That's a 10 okay Any way to 
Ms. Travis, take a look at 40-14-8 and see if there's not a parallel provision uh, to what's been proposed here as subdivision B. So, so this is a parallel provision to something that's already in the code with regard to um, the speed that you have to be over the speed limit in order to use those devices. Is that true? Okay. All right, uh, Representative Setzler. Hey, Mr. Chairman, I'm not trying to over I'm certainly not intending to overcomplicate this. And to, to Representative Benfield. I'm not trying to limit a camera. If there's a technology that, that has a Doppler radar that also has a camera supplement that could be replayed in court, I don't want to exclude that from the process. All I want to make sure in what I'm offering is that there be a law enforcement official that's part of this. I want to have, have, have a person present in operating this, this equipment. I, I don't care what – I'm agnostic to technology, cameras, doesn't matter to me. As long as there's a law enforcement official present, I want to support Representative Benton and what he's doing. So – the effect of anything I'm suggesting has nothing to do with technology. I just want a person present when a speeding citation is given. That's all I'm looking for. So I, I say that to Representative Benfield. I don't know that, that your amendment satisfies my concern. It's a, perhaps a separate concern. Okay. And, and, Mr. Chairman, I would be prepared to make a motion at the appropriate time. Okay. Um, okay, that's all the questions I see. We don't have anyone signed up. Does anyone from the public wish to speak? Mr. Baggett. Just to maybe quickly address some of these things, we support this bill. We testified in favor of it in the subcommittee. Um, to go to some of the issues, um, and as Representative Benton said, there are some cities where the boundaries, uh, you know, the school might be under the, the city limits, and there's adjoining uh, jurisdictions unincorporated or it's a new city. Uh, a lot of times cities don't have the authority by ordinance to change the speed limit. It takes some things. It's a, uh, quite a campaign to get DOT involved with the state highway. They don't have jurisdiction without engineering studies and basically a decision by DOT. So there are places, and I don't know that there's a lot, but there are some where this, there's no easy fix. Um, you know, and our position is, um, you know, Georgia has more obstacles in the code to law enforcement officers making uh, traffic and speeding tickets than any other state in the union. And our position is, you know, given that the number one cause of death for Georgia in 2034 is traffic accidents, there might not be gamesmanship. My understanding, having dealt with the radar code, is it's pretty clear that in order to operate radar, you've got to have a state permit from DPS, and you've got to have law enforcement officers using those radar tickets. That's how those tickets are made. That definition is specific to radar enforcement. So um, you know, even though my group likes technology and likes the, the red light cameras to, to reach the ire of many a legislator, uh, I don't think it's present or a concern of the bill. That's okay. my understanding. All right. Um, Representative Benfield, question? I would just add, um, to piggyback on your comments, Mr. Baggett, uh, I'm looking at Title 35, 35-8-12. There are all sorts of certification requirements in order to operate radar. It's existing in law. Uh, the device itself has to be certified in addition to the law enforcement officer using the radar has to complete <coughs> a course on radar technology. Um, and I, I understand the specific concern is that uh, th within this code section, it's a real live person using the radar. I don't even know. Are there – is there radar being operated without a law enforcement officer? I mean, is that even possible? The, the officer certification is yeah. part of the elements yeah, of proof that have to be made. It's here in the code section. And so, 
it's got to be operated by a certified officer. Therefore, you got to have a real live person. I think it's already covered. Okay, thank you. All right, any further comments? All right, thank you, Mr. Baggett. Uh, Representative Levitas? I would move to pass LC 293713S. By substitute. By substitute. Okay. And we have a motion and a second. Uh, any further discussion from the committee? Any amendments? Seeing none. Call the previous question. All those in favor of passage of HB 287 by substitute uh, signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. One no. The ayes have it. HB 287 passes on. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Duly noted. Duly noted. <laughs> Members of the committee, we're going to go. We are going to go ahead and meet uh, tomorrow morning. We are going to send out a revised agenda in within an hour or so. So uh, please plan on being here at uh, eight thirty tomorrow morning. Thank you.